big tech investing in nuclear power is off to the races, Chama. Amazon just announced a $500 million investment in three nuclear power projects. All of these are focused on SMRs. Those are the small modular reactors. Amazon is working with Dominion Energy to develop a small modular nuclear reactor near an existing nuclear power plant in Virginia. In total, Amazon plans to invest $35 billion in Virginia-based data centers by 2040, and they want to power these by SMRs. And this is a big trend. Google is purchasing energy directly from Kairos. Power, another company building SMRs. Microsoft, as you heard, is reviving one of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plants. So this is kind of interesting, Chamath. We went from nuclear not being on the table, everybody being against it, the Germans shutting down their reactors post Fukushima. And now big tech is the customer for these with AI, and they're putting down very large deposits and payments to build them in America. And I haven't heard any opposition. Maybe you could just speak to Chamath. Well, what I'm, we've look, seen I'm here generally... in terms of opposition to these versus the opportunity and everybody's writing checks. Yeah. Well, they're not writing checks. So this is what I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but these press releases need to have an asterisk on them. So in the hierarchy of deals, right, just to unpack this for a second, there are deals where you give me X and I give you money. That's not what this is. Then if you degrade that kind of deal structure, in a lot of heavy industry, you have deals that are called take or pay, which is there is something that's working and you need to basically take this or you need to give me the monetary equivalent of what I'm selling you. That's not what this is. What this is, is sort of this conditional obligation where the beginning of the deal starts with a very important statement, which is if it works, and if these approvals happen, and there's a whole bunch of nested ifs, then payments can happen. So while these are important deals because they show that there are potential buyers at the finish line, what it doesn't do is solve the two things that you need to get to the finish line, which is the actual risk capital to finish building these things and technically de-risk them, and then the regulatory approval that you need to make sure that they're allowed. So I think that these deals are good. I think it's a great signaling, but I think it's important to understand the nuances of these things. These are not things where there's money really trading hands. And until that you see that, where irrespective of what happens, the balance sheet is investing from an Amazon or a Google, where there's corp dev folks writing, hundred million dollar or billion dollar checks into these companies, it's not yet quite there. This is more the step before, which is sort of, can you create some marketing and, and some buzziness to hopefully induce somebody to then rip in billions of dollars of risk equity capital? Freeberg, your thoughts on SMRs and these customers showing up? And then I guess you could comment on the nature of the deal structure here, because some of them are you know, contingent on the nuclear power plant turning on. Some of them do have deposits, is my understanding. We'll look that up and fact check it. There could be a range of deals here. Yeah, I don't know the nature of the deals. I did, I think, talk about this a year ago. It's, it was also like one, my prediction for the year was to buy the uranium stocks predicated on what I think is a really important point, which is as GDP per capita grows, energy consumption per capita grows. And if you looked at the projections of GDP per capita in industrialized nations, there was no way, there is no way to meet the energy demand. And this was even pre all this crazy AI build out, which is probably part of the GDP growth. But there is no way to meet the energy demand without nuclear. Uh, there is not enough solar, geothermal, or wind build-out potential that's happening, that the stopgap measure is going to have to be, and probably the right long-term solution, is to have a significant amount of base load come from nuclear. And so what's the fastest way to do that nuclear build-out? Well, in China, they have the regulatory authority and the mandate stated they're going to build 300 gigawatts with 300 facilities or whatever the number is. And that's what they're doing, very large facilities that make a gigawatt of power each. In the US, it seems that because of the regulatory structure here and the way that utilities are regulated and the way that the states 
have authority on the environmental laws and all the other things, that it might be the fastest path to solving this energy gap problem is SMRs. And that's why we're, and these things produce tens of megawatts. So again, a gigawatt is a thousand megawatts. And, you know, we need to kind of probably grow our energy production in the United States by several terawatts over the next decade or two. So this SMR may be the fastest path. Now, that could change, meaning we could end up seeing much larger facilities get built out if there's regulatory change in the US and there's more availability. But fundamentally, we are going to need to use uranium to make electricity to meet the demand of the growing the GDP that it seems we're going to, to be growing it. I think this is just such a necessity. It's great to see the SMR is getting some attention. I just don't know if they're actually going to get turned on, how long it's going to take. And, you know, I, I don't know what this election cycle is going to bring in terms of regulatory change. I think we talked about it with several of the candidates when we were doing the interviews. Sachs, if we are able to get a bunch of these SMRs built here in the United States, maybe if Europe follows suit, what would this do on a geopolitical basis to our relationship with the Middle East, our energy independence, and of course, the AI race to you know, general intelligence? I'll let you take it whichever direction you want to go. Well, I don't think we're going to, because I don't think anyone wants a nuclear power plant in their backyard. It's really simple. I mean, no matter what the benefits are for AI or for America's global competitiveness, I just don't think your typical community wants a nuclear power plant in their backyard. And I don't think it matters that much if it's a small modular one either. So you think they'll get blocked by local communities? Yeah, and probably for good reason. I mean, I don't want a nuclear power plant in my backyard. Do you? I feel like this has suddenly become a little bit of a luxury belief where liberal elites are always talking about how we need to have nuclear power now. But they know they're not going to have a nuclear power plant in their backyard. So it's easy for, for all of yeah. us to genuflect about what a great idea this is. But let's face it, it's, it these things are going to be built probably in poor or working class communities. And inevitably, there's going to be some accident. I mean, you can tell me how safe they are to your blue in the face. I don't believe it. You know, planes aren't supposed to fall out of the sky either. And it does happen. And, you know, they're going to set up a, a power, one of these power plants somewhere. And you know, it's probably going to have a DEI program and something's going to happen. I mean, <laughs> something's going to happen. And then the, the fallout is, is, is literally going to fall out on, on the people in that poor community. So uh, I don't think this is going to happen. This show really has a diversity of views, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Look, this is a perfect example of liberal business elites demanding something <laughs> that isn't going to affect them. It's not going to affect Freeburg. them. Your take on a non-binary <laughs> trans lesbian with purple no hair, whatever you're putting, saying, no uh, putting, <laughs> putting a small nuclear reactor 200 miles outside of Austin, Texas. Go. <laughs> Put your tinfoil hat on. Yeah, how Freeburg. close do you want it to your ranch, Jim Cal? I mean, I think there's plenty of land outside of the triangle here in Texas where there is no density and you could put one and I'd have no problem with there being one 100 miles, 200 miles. And who's going to work there? Who's going to service it? I mean, literally, you would have to, it doesn't take that many people to, to service these. So, yeah. Until I mean, something I, goes wrong. I think there's plenty of space in the United States to put these and maybe Freeberg, you could talk and educate us on the safety here. Do you believe what Sachs is saying that it's going to have a meltdown and he doesn't believe Sachs it? I think Sachs is point of view, to be honest, is the point of view that will be held by a large number of people, just like they have been with a lot of other... Is it the of, right uh, point of view, though? Tell us from a science perspective. Well, no, no, I don't, I don't think it is. I think that the same argument would have been made around we shouldn't have airplanes at all because they can fall from the sky. We should keep everyone on the ground where they're safe. Why would you want to get on an airplane? Why would you want to have airplanes flying over your home? We should all ban airplanes flying over our home. They could crash in our home. It's the same sort of argument. And the reason I'm not going to argue the point is because I, I, because of the point I made earlier, which is that it ultimately becomes an economic necessity that for us to meet all of the demands of AI, all of the demands of industry, we want to reindustrialize the United States, et cetera, et cetera. We need to increase electricity production capacity on the continent. And there is no way to generate enough electricity on this continent fast enough using other means than there would be if we just got these these systems set up. So, so you believe they will, will end go up through out of necessity? 
That's your take. I think globally this is the case, and we're seeing it in China now. Where the U. Whether the U.S. ends yeah, up China becoming a Luddite, have to worry about a NIMBY problem. The CCP that's right. they just don't have says to, this is what yeah, we're going to do. Yeah, that's it's right. And, and here, and we may we may end <laughs> they up are being the, the China Lud- is the M in NIMBY. My yeah, and we may be the we may end up being the Luddite state, and we'll end up just saying, you know what, we're not going to adopt new technology, they including put the now things in like NIMBY. gene editing and cell cell therapies. And I'll go through the list of new technology sets. I think there's a, you could make I the think, argument that there's a low probability of a high risk event. But the fact is that the progress that it enables is worth so much more than the risk that we would be taking on. There's a simpler solution to all of this without having to go and create these reactors, which is, I don't think that we have a very good grasp of the material science, broadly speaking. I don't think we really understand how to build next generation materials. I don't think our specialty chemicals capabilities are all that strong. The way that they're going to be over the next five or 10 years, just with better compute. So I think that there's going to be a lot of interim steps that increase the generally available energy density without going to nuclear. I think there's going to be a lot of businesses to do that. That'll be much safer, easier to regulate, easier to test, easier to underwrite. Hmm. And I think the government will get behind those. So I'm not as negative as you are on the only solution being nuclear. The countries and uh, the businesses that have a lower cost of electricity and a more abundant source of electricity will end up winning as the economy continues to progress towards a much more kind of digital state and an automated state over the next decades. So if we're going to be slower, we're going to suffer the consequences of that as a country. So we'll see how it plays out. I just think that economic incentives will ultimately drive, hopefully, a change. Would a um, possible solution be to give an economic incentive to the people who would be in the surrounding areas? Obviously, these things could be 50 or 100 miles from, you know, anybody's homes, but even the people who work there or people who might have, I don't know, some homes that were near it, could you give them no taxes, et cetera, essentially give them incentives to allow this to go through Freeberg in your mind? Do you think that kind of incentive would work? Taxes or some kind of payoff or subsidy? I, I'm not sure. I haven't thought yeah. much about like what, what the incentives or subsidies would be. Yeah, I think you're going to have to give them an incentive because no one's going to want to live within 200 miles of one of these things. What would be the number I think Freeberg is right. I think that people, people have a very deep fear of you know, what is deemed to be cataclysmic technology. I do think a lot of this was rooted in the evolution of the atomic age, where we basically have these nuclear warheads mounted to missiles that can travel at 20 times the speed of sound and land on your city and wipe out your city. I mean, that that is also nuclear technology, and people conflate the two as being similar. And even Three Mile Island, there were, you know, no deaths. It was a shocking, scary thing for people. But Statistically speaking and historically speaking and technically speaking, it's a lot more complicated to explain to people what happened and why and why now is different. And no one has the time for that. No one wants to hear that. They want to hear a very simple. Do you really want a nuclear power plant in your backyard? No way. What about you? No way. All right, let's let's vote to stop it. And they're right. I mean, mean, you you compare it, you compare it to commercial airlines, but commercial airlines, that's a technology that's been around for what, like 100 years. Do you have any data on on the safety record of nuclear technology? Because I'm not sure you do. I think my point is like, you're just making a statement out of fear. Let's see the data. Where's the data? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it right now. I mean, I I think this is an important discussion. I'd like to actually. My point point about commercial airlines is we've had that technology for over 100 years. It was honed and refined over many decades and commercial airlines now have become Sachs, this is this Boeing is going on almost 100 this is going on 100 years of use right you know that there have been incidents every decade or two and that is that's why that's not true that's not true you're you're saying something that's not true the reason nuclear has been discredited is because of three mile island and fukushima it has not been, and first of all it's not been discredited Chernobyl. It's, it, i mean it, these names no, live in infamy it's social fear mongering like you were doing right now with no data and no facts to try and make it a political issue that drives everyone to one just, side, shut their minds down, and not listen to the actual facts and data. And this fear mongering is what keeps us from being competitive, what keeps us from having progress. You talk a lot about people I'm not talking shit about I'm Elon. Just, listen, listen, I, I'm, I'm just saying I don't want one near me. Now, okay. if there, hold on a second, Let I'm not get, saying you there can't There were 46 do, deaths at Chernobyl. I'm not against doing it somewhere where the community is in favor of doing it. So if you can hmm. find a place that wants to do this, I would not stop it. Just to be clear, I'm and, just and saying I don't want one let, near let, me. Let's get to facts. Yeah, and we got you. Jake, just give me a second. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to find many takers, even among poor communities. It's a great adversarial point. Let's go to There's the facts. There's 440 nuclear power reactors operating in 32 countries around the world since the time that we first had nuclear reactors, which has now been almost a century. There have been three incidents. 
Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island. At Three uh, Mile yeah. Island, there were zero deaths. <laughs> at Fukushima, there was one death. And at Chernobyl, there were 46 deaths. The fallout from those events has been that we shut down energy production, we shut down nuclear reactor technology, and we fear-mongered our way into losing the most abundant, available, Can I just ask a question? Of energy. Do those yeah. deaths actually include the second and third order effects of all this radiation? At Chernobyl, there were 15 people who got thyroid cancer, 35 operators and first responders who got radiation sickness, and then the background radiation effects, there's a lot of kind of noise around this, but it's not a significant number as you may otherwise think. Same with Fukushima. Why is it that whole region is still uninhabited then? They had a radiation event. There's radioactive material that has covered that area that will be radioactive for a long period of time. Now, to understand what happened there and why that won't happen again requires talking about the difference in the technology between Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, and Gen 4 systems. A lot of what's being rolled out now are these Gen 3 nuclear reactors. And the Gen 4 systems, which we highlighted a little while ago, do not have a meltdown possibility, right? We, we talked about this, the one that went online in China in December. Those new systems, the Gen 4 reactors, cannot melt down. You cannot have an incident like you did with the Gen 1 and Gen 2 systems. And the Gen 3 systems are abundantly safe. China is building hundreds of them. It is a, it is a totally like understandable science. If we want to spend the time looking at the data and understanding the engineering and the material science work and all the effort that's gone in, billions of dollars over decades. The biggest stumbling block and the biggest wall has been the fact that people have this fear-mongering activity that they tell people, just dismiss it. It's too scary. We don't want it in our backyard. Let's move on to the next opportunity. That's what's killed it. And if you just put these things 50 miles away, the radiation, even in the meltdowns, didn't go past those, was my understanding. No. So no. The, we... We, even if you want to, just the, the easiest steel man. The new this systems don't melt is, down. You don't have that possibility. And the SMRs. I, agree, I am in 100% agree with you. The new systems don't even work. These SMRs, they don't work. That if may they're be another so point. new, how can you say for sure what the safety record's going to be? Oh, that's. Just to be clear, SMRs don't work yet. We have theoretical ways in which we can profile and model that they work, but we don't have a functional one that people can look at and inspect. As part of that, we haven't been able to test how they fail. Those are also theoretical. So I think let's put SMRs off and let's just be very accurate. We don't have a functioning working version of one because they don't work yet. Maybe they'll work in the future. Let's hope that they do. There's what about you're talking six, about, Freeberg, is a, yeah. is a step before that, which is the Gen 3 reactor, which there, has a different are, safety. There are people. SMRs operating in China, Russia, and India today. And there's about 65 being built at this moment, right? So, and that's ex outside the U.S. So that's why the U.S. is pr is, a, is kind of observing and trying to catch up and adopt these technologies that are being used by, call it, economic competitors and economic partners around the world. It's important for economic prosperity in the U.S. for us to have a degree of competitiveness in electricity prices. If China races towards five cents per kilowatt hour for electricity, and we're sitting here at 20 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, What's that well, going to do to our economic we are, competitiveness? We are at five cents in the generation. And you're so saying we solar, can, right? We can fix that tomorrow. We already we already rely on a nuclear reactor that works. And to Sachs's point, it just happens to be millions of miles away. So it can, if it goes, we're all going to go anyways. Yeah, the scalability of, of solar in terms of getting us to a terawatt of production capacity is the, the limiting block, Chamath, that in order to get to a terawatt of I think of that's a material science problem. I don't think that's, you don't yeah. need to Maybe run Maybe it's not such a bad to... thing that other countries are taking the early adopter risk well, of this technology. Well, I was about to say, that would be, that's going to be the, the force. In, yeah, that's going to be, but, but if they're, if China runs away with this and they have so many of these running and then they're able to power AI and solve problems, we're not, we're going to have to get our act together and start uh, standing these up. I don't and think they just have to be 50. Limiting. Every Navy submarine has got a nuclear reactor on board. That's and how we have power. so much Every space in this country. These things could be 100, 200 miles away. But I don't think energy anybody. is a limiting factor in our ability to innovate. I don't think it is today. In these data centers? Certainly. It's it not the limiting these... factor in our ability to innovate. It's not the limiting factor in, like, for example, we're you asking know, us to why? charge up every car every night with electricity, with a battery, rather than using gasoline. Let me just make my point. So right. we just saw OpenAI launch Strawberry. Is the reason why Microsoft or Google or Meta not responded with their own version an energy problem? No. We're still rate limited by innovation and just raw intellectual horsepower and capability. Meanwhile, we are trying to solve the energy problem, and people are taking different approaches. There's storage that's coming online very aggressively. 
the solar capability itself is ramping up aggressively. We're also forcing these utilities to actually be deconstructed so that there's more efficiency in the energy markets. All of this, if you unpack why it costs 20 cents a kilowatt hour, it's not because of a generation problem. It is not. It's graft, it's corruption, it's old legacy infrastructure. All of it can be replaced in a much simpler and safer way. So I think by the time that you are rate limited by energy, you'll have a plethora of solutions. My issues with the SMRs is the ones that are promising these next-gen whiz-bang performance characteristics, they're all theoretical free proof. So even when you say there are SMRs working abroad, there's no like next generation reactors working abroad. They don't work. What do you, they, they, Where is an example of these modern next generation reactors actually working? Where? Well, we talked about the Gen 4 one that went live in China. There's several SMRs in several countries that are active producing power. You can call it a small modular reactor. What I'm talking about, these next gen materials, the things that Kairos and these other guys are trying to do. Where is a functioning Here, working I'll version? I'll show you. Of? They have them. I mean, like, we have one in India, we have one in China. I'll show you the, I'll send you links to them here. There's about 50 of them that India is actively building right now. And they're, they're competitive with Kairos, right? They all have kind of common design concepts, but they're different companies. Anyway, I'm just saying like they're, they're what would getting rolled out. be the out. harm, and just Freeberg, maybe you can educate us in the distance it could be from a city reasonably in terms of building a grid to move the energy from, could it be? 200 miles from a major city, 300, 100. What's it? Yeah, what's it? Wherever distance? you want. You can put power but, production wherever you want. But it has move to it travel. Through right? As long as you got the copper to move it, right? You move yeah. the electrons. Yeah, I'm just trying to think reasonably move it is, uh, I guess, what I was getting at. But okay, well, there you have it, folks. A good debate here on the all in. A good podcast. debate. A good, debate. A good debate. I still love you all. We'll lay, yeah. we'll lay copper from some country that has an SMR all the way That's to, right. all the you way know, it's to funny that Washington was, State. I was just thinking, like, if Canada and Mexico have, you know, economic incentive to do this, or they're more bold, maybe they build them in their countries and then <laughs> Let they'll be selling the it to the United States, right? They'll take the, I mean, <laughs> if you're Kairos and you can't put this in the United States, but you could put it in Mexico and then come up with a, you know, a way to get it past Trump's border wall. You may be able to put it into the United States, but we won't know until we know it works. Hmm. <laughs> just i'm sorry i keep going back to this tricky little issue if it doesn't work <laughs> well i mean i think freeberg i'm with you and that the even with the disasters that have happened those are with gen one and gen two reactors there hasn't been one in a long time and the yeah, fallout and, and from that them I believe, haven't been i believe those things if we can spin those up right now these gen two gen three reactors do them all day long i think that they're very safe they're very no, the three and four the three in your are, backyard the, the, the threes are I what would we be should fine be with one being a hundred miles from my backyard, no problem. It's four that's producing in China yeah. is producing a gigawatt of power. Would you own like, ten miles outside Austin? I don't think you should put it ten miles outside of any city. I know that they're doing that in India, they're doing that in China. I would think I you know, if you look up the footprint of Fukushima, I mean that was a complete disaster. They put that below sea level, they told them not to put it there, and they put it near a bunch of people who, you know, were living within miles of it, single digit miles of it. There's no reason for this to be any closer than 50 or 100 miles. And I would be totally fine with it being 50 to 100 miles from where I'm on my ranch right now. 